It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the unappeasable John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably John Hersey. How you doing this morning, John? I'm great. My my dog decided that he wants to tell you how he's doing too. Sorry about him in the background. What's his name? That's Gumbo, who's uh, a little talkative right now. He's um. One of two. The other is Bayou, but Gumbo is a German Shepherd Poodle mix. There he is. Lay down, bud. Well, you know, Gumbo sounds like he's a bona fide hero worshiper. He wants to be part of the show. Absolutely. He's really into physics. You know, he's the German, the German Shepherd. You know, he's got that sort of German engineering pedigree. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he's uh, so was Einstein, you know, so... Uh, uh, in fact, Einstein figures briefly in in some of the stories we're going to tell today about another great physicist, you know, namely Richard Feynman. So I hope you know something about physics, John, because uh, all of this all of this science goes over my head. Um, I think it, I think quantum mechanics was designed to make your head hurt. Um, so yeah, let's just say at the outset that neither of us are physicists. And uh, we won't go into the nitty gritty, but we'll try to relay some of it the best we can. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, when we when we discussed uh, Isaac Newton, we had a, a genuine physicist on 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 the show. Right. Lawrence Gould to uh, to help us with that. But today we'll just muddle through uh, on our own. Feynman, Richard Feynman, of course, uh, a, a fascinating character as well as a brilliant uh, scientist. His dates were 1918 to 1988. Died, you know, relatively young. Was just short of his 70th birthday from uh, some form of cancer, wasn't it? As, as I recall. Yeah, a, a rare form of cancer, the name of which escapes me now. But I was excited. Um, I think this is the second year in a row that I note and then forget about the fact that I, I feel so honored to share a birthday with Richard Feynman, born May 11th. Uh, 1918, as you said, and um, you know he would be the first to say that horoscopes and that that junk is just trash. It doesn't mean anything. In fact, in one of his lectures uh, at Cornell in the Messenger series, he talks about how uh, you know we've got all this great science and still people are using it to to tell the same myths that they have for two thousand years. But yeah, anyway, yeah, well. He married Arlene Greenbaum, who we'll, we'll, we'll discuss on June 29th, which is my birthday. So, you know, we, we have, we have a, we, <laughs> for whatever this is worth, you know, we have, we have some personal connection to, to Feynman. But the thing that interested me, you know, he, he's, from, he's from New York, from Queens, and went to high school. Interests you. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he, uh, he went to Far Rockaway High School, and, he, you know, he, and he had, he, he spoke like one of the cool kids. He had, you know, a New York accent, um, and uh, so, somebody somebody said Feynman spoke like a bum, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, he I had knew a he, bum like that. Yeah, well, yeah, he had he 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 talked he talked good, as they would say in my in my native Brooklyn, and uh, <laughs> although people didn't find out at first because he was a late talker, he didn't he didn't start. He didn't start speaking until he was like three years old or maybe even past his third birthday. Oh, I didn't know that about him. That's so interesting. Of course, we talked about Thomas Sowell on the show who who has done some work on this and theorized that late talkers talk late because at the early stage, they're putting all their brain power into sort of spatial reasoning and things like that. And that would that would make perfect sense for a guy like Feynman. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you know, when, when he took these various uh, entrance exams, to prestigious universities like Princeton, he would absolutely crush, you know, the math physics part of it. He'd get a perfect score, I think, at Princeton, which was he might have been the only person, or maybe the first person, to do so. But did not do well on the verbal portions, you know, in, in, in English and, and and history, I you know, in subjects like that. I suppose those fields just didn't interest him, and he just never you know put much uh, pay much attention to it. Yeah, it's funny. He said that he was lopsided. He was very one sided. He put all his time and attention into science. And he said something like, I have a very limited capacity and I put it all in one particular direction. 
Yeah. Right. Well, his IQ, the IQ test showed at 125, which was high, but not, you know, not, not genius level. And various people have commented on that and said, well, well you know, he, he wasn't really so great at, hum, at humanity stuff and verbal portions of the test. But if you just look at the math, you know, the math science portions of the test, he absolutely crushed it. You know, and you can say he was a, he was a genius in that field. You know, I, I think his, his achievements uh, and his well-deserved Nobel Prize in physics certainly, certainly show that. Anyhow, so he talked good, which, you know, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to, to relate. He, uh, his, his father, even though he was a late talker, his father evidently encouraged questioning and, you know, and challenged, uh, you know, that, that you should challenge orthodox thinking. He, uh, the, family, the family were Jews, but I don't know, I don't know that, they were, that his parents were very observant. Yeah, in fact, his, his family didn't observe Judaism. And there's this great story that really uh, illustrates the irreverence that his father infused him with at a, at a young age. Uh, he sat him on his lap and, and maybe he didn't sit him on his lap, but anyway, they, they were sitting there looking at a, a newspaper or a magazine together. And he pointed at a picture of the Pope and a bunch of people that were bowing down, bowing down before him. And he said, look at these people. Uh, what's going on here? That's the Pope. What's the difference between him and these other people? A polis, you know, uniform. That's the only difference. Uh, he just thought it was ridiculous that people would venerate somebody and there, there's really, you know, no, no real difference between one human being and another in any metaphysical or, or meaningful sense. Right, right. Like you said, Feynman was very young, you know, and, and he described himself as as an atheist. He was disappointed. He he said with the Talmud and these Talmudic scholars, with these rabbis, who was uh, you know studied the Talmud so carefully, as he put it, you know they 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 they, they don't care. It doesn't ask any questions about nature. There's no there's no there's no d desire to learn anything about you know about the world around us. There's, there's the, these these so called scholars are only interested in, in the questions raised in in the Talmud, and he had you know he had no interest in that. Yeah, he got no pleasure from it. Uh, there's this great quote where he says something like, uh, "Physics is like sex; um, it's not very practical, but that's not why we do it." <laughs> <laughs> great documentary well, of him called "The Pleasure of Finding Things Out," and he really did take great pleasure in finding things out. And, you know, here are these Talmudic scholars are, they're not finding anything out. They're not taking any pleasure in, in that way that he did. Yeah. And then they're, they're not right. They're not concerned with understanding nature as, as he put it, which is, you know, the, the insight of and the, the line of a real scientist, you know, wanting to know how things, how things work. I, you know, why we're talking about uh, scientists you know, uh, we should mention his youngest sister, Joan, Joan Feynman, because she's already come up on the Hero Show. You know, we've already discussed her briefly when we were discussing Cecilia Payne. Uh, you, you know, and it's, it's, it's a fascinating story because I think she's, she was nine years younger than, than Richard. And uh, her, her interest in science was, was kindled, evidently, when there was, he dragged her out of bed one night and across, you know, to a, a, near, to a nearby golf course to, was, was to observe, I think it was a lunar eclipse, um, and uh, it got her very interested in science. But her, her mother and her grandmother were convinced that, you know, female, the female brain can't handle these, these scientific concepts and these, these scientific principles. Richard evidently encouraged his little, his little sister, but the real inspiration was when she, when she was reading about Cecilia Payne and, and, and real, realized that, that, that Cecilia Payne had made all these advances in, in astrophysics and that, that showed her in, in action that mom and grandma are just wrong, <laughs> they're just wrong on, on, on this issue and uh, uh, that encouraged her you know, to go on and have a real career in science herself. It's a fascinating story. Yeah, it really is. And, and some people think that for various reasons that Richard Feynman was a sexist. 
but that certainly did, was not reflected in his views of uh, female aptitude and what females are, are capable of doing in science. Not only did he encourage his, his sister, but uh, he would, you know, people were surprised when there was this um, controversy. He later worked at, at Caltech, as we'll get to. There's this controversy about uh, a female professor who was paid less than all of the other professors. And there was a trial and he defended her and she ended up winning and, and was, um, you know, she was blocked from getting tenure. And, and so not only was she, um, you know, not only did they remove that roadblock, they also fixed the, the disparity in her salary in part um, on the, on the testimony in support of Richard Feynman. Yeah. I, it's, it's really peculiar. You know, there's these, these old, old school, old world prejudices about the intellectual capacities of, of women. You remember uh, Cecilia Payne uh, did all the work, was it at Cambridge? She did all the work and they, they wouldn't give her a degree because of, because of her gender. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. And uh, I was surprised, Feynman is a, is a German name, you know, and the German Jews tended to be, you know, educated and, you know, and successful, not like the East European Jews who were much, who were much more oppressed in Poland and Ukraine and Russia and, and, and less educated. So I'm surprised that, Fe you know, the Feynman's mother and grandmother, you know, had that uh, old, old world view of the, of the capacities of the, of the female brain. Anyway, th thankfully, you know, Joan Feynman was able to overcome that. Evidently, she scored higher on the IQ test, uh, Joan, higher than 125. And so she always, she always teased her brother that I'm smarter you know, I'm smarter than, than, uh, than you. She must, she, she could have possibly have done better on the math science portions of the test. So she must have, she must have paid more attention to the humanities, you know, to, to literature and history and, 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 and those fields to, to outscore, outscore her, her brother, who's an absolute genius in, in, in his field. Yeah. You know, I wonder what sort of role um, their father, Melville, uh, had on, in her education. So one thing that I think is really, really interesting about Feynman's early childhood education is his father's focus on this very independent, inductive, reality-first approach. Um, so, you know, he would, he, he would uh, read to Richard from the Encyclopedia Britannica. And he would so for, for instance, he tells this story about, they were reading about the Tyrannosaurus Rex and they would read, oh, it's 25 feet tall and it's, its head is, is six feet wide. So they'd set the book aside for a minute and, and say, well, what does that actually mean? And well, if it's 25 feet tall, he, he would be tall enough to stick his head into the upstairs windows, but he couldn't quite do it because his head's about six feet wide. So he'd, he'd actually break the window in the frame as he, as he came in. And so here they are translating these broad abstract concepts into physical concretes. And I think this is something that is just so lost in education today. There are people who have, you know, they're, obviously we've talked about progressive educators uh, who have this idea that the, the focus should be on socializing the, the child, but then even the better educators think, well, what you're really doing is building this web of logic and that misses the key point that Feynman's father didn't miss, which is this web of logic has to be tied to something, has to be tied back down to reality in the form of, of evidence, in the form of concretes. And so Feynman, from a very young age, was training his, his mind in thinking in very concrete, inductive uh, terms. And I think that this makes all the difference. I mean, there's, the, there's the, the late talking portion of this that I'm just learning as well, which is really interesting. But then there's the, you know, the fact that he is uh, learning how to, how to think in, in a, a reality first manner from, from a really young age. And I wonder how much his sister got of that. I wonder how much Joan got of that from their father. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if, if he shared, you know, his wife and the, the mother and grandmother's view that that's not science isn't for girls. I don't know if I don't know if he did or he didn't. But uh, yeah, you're right. That's that's um, you, you're talking about education, even at, even even the people who are, you know, uh, 
acad- who, want, who want to teach academic subjects, who, uh, you know, who uh, realize the importance of academic subjects, very often do it in that very rationalistic way that you, that you, that you, met, you mentioned, and t- tying it to, to observational reality, tying it to actual, actual concretes is, you know, is a great, is a, is a really important part of, of education, and, and Richard is lucky he got it from his dad. And uh, obviously, super smart in this field. He, at, at age 15, he taught himself trigonometry, advanced algebra, <laughs> analytic geometry, differential and integral calculus. Uh, I mean, he was just, he, he, was, he was a prodigy in this field. And went to Far Rockaway High School in Queens, New York, where I mean, there were several, uh, several other Nobel Prize winners came out of, came out of that school. I don't, I don't remember their names offhand, but I know they were. Yeah, and, and then in 1939, um, he graduates from Princeton as, as a Putnam Fellow. And uh, interesting, in, in both, so he, he did undergraduate and graduate degrees. And in, in both cases, um, he was questioned, or not directly, but the, the people doing the, uh, doing the admissions questioned whether or not they should let this this Jew in, and you know, he applied to Columbia originally, but he was turned down because the school apparently had already met its quota for the number of Jews that they were going to let in. So he ends up going to MIT for his undergrad. Right, right. You know, I was I was thinking, John, when I when I was reading that, I said, you know, if you well, if you're going to have this prejudicial quota towards you know any ethnic group, maybe you should make an exception for somebody like Feynman. You know, I mean, you, you, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and they had no way of knowing that he was going to go on to be a you know, Nobel Prize winner, but and and and, leg, and legitimate Nobel Prize winner. I mean, there are people who get Nobel prizes. You're know, like Yasser Arafat in, got the Peace Prize, who was a bloody-handed terrorist, and. Um, Paul Krugman got the Nobel Prize in Economics. I read his column and I'm, I'm thinking, this guy, if you understand Econ 101, I mean, some of the stuff he's, he says is just, is just really wrong. But, but being it as it may, you know, Feynman was such a math science whiz that you think, well, maybe, maybe we let in one over the, our prejudicial quota, you know, as you know, um, in this case. But you're right. I mean, he went to MIT and, and, and did well. And speaking of the, the anti-Semitic bias. You know, you know that that story from Princeton. The the the, the Princeton the head of the Princeton physics department was concerned about Feynman. Did you? Yeah, I, I came across that as well. Go ahead. Yeah, he uh, he he asked. I guess somebody who who knew Feynman is is is, is Feynman a, a Jew? And the guy said, "Yeah, well, I, I wrote it down." What did he said? But, but don't. In effect, don't worry about it because his his physiognomy and manner show no sign of this characteristic. It's not funny. It's not funny. This is, is ignorant racism. But his physiognomy and manner show no sign of, of of this characteristic. Yeah, the head of the Princeton physics department said, "I have no problem have, you know, having Jews here, but we we have difficulty placing them." You know, the, I guess I guess various schools didn't want to hire these guys as as professors. So at at MIT, to go back just a little bit, he originally majored in math, but he thought it was just too abstract. And so he switched to electrical engineering and then realized that he had overcorrected. And then so he switched to physics. And just while he's an undergrad at MIT, he publishes two papers in the journal Physical Review, uh, or at least the first one was in Physical Review. And uh, he co-authored it with one of his professors, Manuel Volarta. And the, the paper actually ended, ended up being cited by the German physicist Werner Eisen, Heisenberg in a, the conclusion to his book on cosmic rays. And uh, the, the quote actually ended with, uh, this is not to be expected on the theory of Villarda and Feynman. And he was thrilled about this because it was literally the last sentence in the book. And so he wrote to his, his professor, you know why I'm grinning from ear to ear? And he said something like, yeah, because you're the last word in cosmic race. <laughs> was, it, was it cosmic race? Was it cosmic race? Um, was, that what it was, was that what it was about? 
Uh, I don't remember. I think so, but oh, well, well, no. I'll, okay, that's good because you remind me. That's uh, that's what Robert Stadler, the theoretical physicist and Atlas Shrugged, was his his specialty was uh, was cosmic rays. So I wonder if Feynman ever read any of. I guess he did it, given his lack of interest in in the humanities. I suppose Feynman never read any of, of Ayn Rand's novels, but he might have been, given how independent he was in his own approach. He he probably would have been fascinated by Howard Rock in the Fountainhead and Ayn Rand's other heroes. But yes, okay, so he's the last word in Cosmic Rays. <laughs> As a kid, right, it was, he's, a, he's a college kid at, at MIT. And then uh, uh, anything else about MIT before we go on to Princeton? I think it's the second paper published, uh, Force and Molecules, which laid out a, a theory in quantum physics that is beyond me to explain. So <laughs> we yeah, can me, yo, leave that there. And me, I was just an English major, you know, in uh, in uh, in college. No, no physics, no physics for me. But I know, I know, like we we mentioned before, when he he went to Princeton, got his PhD in physics, he he absolutely annihilated the entrance exam, got a perfect score which nobody had ever done before. I'm not sure if anybody has done since, but, but Feynman uh, did, and, he, and he, was a, he, was a, he was a prodigy. Did you, did you see some of the luminaries who attended his first seminar at Princeton? Yeah, he, so I wasn't sure if this was a seminar that he was taking or giving, but yeah, if it was one he was giving, this is even more, yeah, I mean, this just goes to show you his incredible intellect, even as, as the young person. Yeah, yeah, I, I had the same question when I was reading this, and I'm 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 just gonna I'm gonna take a guess here that since the seminar was on the the wheel of Feynman absorber theory, I'm guessing that that Feynman was presenting. You know that 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 he was presenting in this seminar just happened to have in the audience one Albert Einstein, and to, you know the leading scientist of the 20th century, who we have to do, you know, an episode of the Hero Show on, and John von Neumann, what, like one of the great mathematicians of, uh, of history and, and a bunch of other top flight, you know, big name, big time uh, scientist mathematicians. And, and Feynman is a, uh, is a grad student and, and very young. He had to be like in his early 20s. And, uh, you know, it's, yeah, this is, this is just... It's extraordinary. I mean, he's he was making these advances at such a young age. But I'm guessing that he was presenting here because it was the it was because the topic was the wheel of Feynman absorber theory. Whatever the wheel of Feynman absorber theory happens to be, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't need to know the details of his discoveries and improvements in in physics to know that all of this knowledge is connected, right? And, and he made a point of this. He was very big on, on making the point of, about integration. In fact, a beautiful line from his Messenger Series lecture at Cornell in 1964. Um, he ends with, nature uses only the longest threads to weave her patterns so that each small piece of her fabric reveals the organization of the entire tapestry. And what he's talking about here is that, and he talks about this earlier too, that one discovery leads to another leads to another and that you can't sometimes there's no way to find out this other fact there's no clear path to this other fact without going through this one and so you know perhaps we may never be able to understand quantum physics and and many of the the things that Feynman discovered and even if those things in themselves don't have clear practical value the fact is that all these ideas are somehow connected and that one discovery leads to another and and the entire thing pushes forward human progress. So, yeah, right, right. Feynman very, very well aware, um, you know, of a point here that Ayn Rand made in epistemology and the the, the importance of, of integrating, of, of going wide, of seeing the big picture, that the, the interconnectedness of of human knowledge. So certainly, Feynman very aware of that in his field, in uh, you know, in in, in physics and, and in mathematics. Um, so, okay, so he's a young guy, he's, he's a, gets a PhD in physics from Princeton, uh, and this is, this is early uh, during World War I, I'm not World War, World War II, and right? when he, uh, he's, in his early, he's in his early 20s, he's, he's 23 in 1941 
when the United States gets drawn into into World War II. And um, mean, in the meantime, tied up with the work he's going to do with the Manhattan Project is his relationship with his high school girlfriend, Arlene Greenbaum, who we should mention because it's, it's a really touching story, shows Feynman's better side in dealing with women because he had a, a, dark, a darker side that, we, you know, that we, we, we will criticize him for. But this is a very touching, very romantic story with, uh, with Richard Feynman and Arlene Greenbaum. Yeah, one of the conditions of his PhD scholarship at Princeton was that he would be unmarried. And he continued to see his high school sweetheart throughout. Uh, and then once he got his PhD, they went to a, uh, a city office in, on Staten Island and got married against the wishes, I believe, of both of their parents, but they didn't care. And one of the reasons what that, that uh, you know, many didn't approve of this relationship was that Arlene had contracted tuberculosis, which at the time was an incurable disease. And in fact, after the wedding, he had to bring her back to the hospital and could only visit her on weekends and things like that. And so, um, you know, December 7th, 1941, day that will forever live, live in infamy, the uh, Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, U.S., is lured into World War II, and Oppenheimer, Robert, Robert Oppenheimer, starts a program at Los Alamos to build an atomic bomb and basically is signing up the best minds from all over the U.S. and in some cases from around the world. And so it's not long before Feynman gets a call and, and Robert Oppenheimer personally finds a sanatorium for Arlene uh, there in uh, New Mexico, so that he can, so that Feynman can come and uh, and and not be so far from her that he can't see her on weekends and and occasionally during a week once in a while. So, right, right. And Oppenheimer was a you know you know a genius in his field. Uh, unfortunately, had ties to communists. In fact, the FBI. We we know today that the the FBI had him under surveillance, and he had. He had joined the Communist Party. Um, but the, the thing about Oppenheimer is that he was not spying for the Soviets. So you know, as, as, uh, the Manhattan Project was rife with Soviet agents. You know, and uh, we know that's how you know, the Soviets eventually uh, got the bomb. But uh, Oppenheimer was a you know, brilliant scientist. He was charismatic. Uh, you know, he, he certainly induced you know, very young Feynman to come to Los Alamos to work on the Manhattan Project, you know, the, the, the the bomb, enormous, enormous as the Soviets' uh, code name for it, uh, and uh, yeah, he got found a found a Oppenheimer himself found a place for for uh, Arlene Arlene Greenbaum Feynman in a sanitarium there, and um, so so the sad you know it's a sad very touching story how much you know they loved each other but she tuberculosis unfortunately could not be cured. Uh, back then, and she passed away at this at this very young age. Yeah, Feynman was with her when she passed, and he didn't really know what to do after, and so he threw himself into his work. And um, you know, he did a lot of things at Los Alamos for the for the Manhattan Project and at Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee as well. Um, but most of them were sort of like odd jobs. You know, he led a team of of human computers. Um, he devised systems for using punch cards to do calculations. Uh, he uh, did some some uh, did some figuring on numbers for uh, fission bomb yields, stuff that I don't understand, obviously. <laughs> but uh, apparently he was not a major player in this project. And uh, at some point he is um, he sent away to Oak Ridge in Tennessee to set up a safety protocol for them because they were ha handling enriched uranium, incredibly dangerous. And so he goes there and, and sets up the safety protocol. And when he comes back, um, Niels Bohr, another great physicist, uh, often seeks him out for conversation because he knows that Feynman is one of the only people there that's not so odd by him that he won't question him and push back on his ideas. 
and be for him what psychologists today call a challenge network. You know, somebody who's going right. to question your ideas, like a great example, Orville and Wilbur Wright, who talked about you know, always, you know, scrapping, but never really attacking each other, just pushing back on their ideas and getting each other to, to think harder and better. And so Feynman played that role for Niels Bohr. Right. Uh, and, and from what I, from what I understand, Bohr, you know, you know, Feynman said that, you know, he respected Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr's a giant, you know, in, in the field. And um, uh, Feynman said, he, Feynman's still a young guy. He's in his 20s. <laughs> Excuse me. Feynman said he respected Bohr, you know, as much as anybody. But he said, once I got talking about physics, he's all the social niceties went out the window and I just, you know, hammered away on these points. And evidently Bohr, you know, like you said, came to him for pushback on his ideas, but he never warmed to him personally, perhaps because, you know, Feynman uh, could be abrasive, you know, on, uh, and when he was d disagreeing with, with, with somebody. I don't, but, uh, but anyway, uh, Bohr, you're right, Bohr came to him for, you know, for that kind of pushback, even if Feynman wasn't like, you know, a master of, of personal etiquette in his dealings with people when he, when he, disagreed, when he disagreed with them. But also going back to Los, Los Alamos, John, Feynman had a penchant for safe cracking. He was <laughs> he was fascinated by it, and he was you know cracking safes and stuff. The Manhattan Project. I mean, you talk about audacity. This is you know we're we're, we're talking the the highest level of you know of secret secretiveness. Although we know today U.S. security. At Los Alamos was pretty bad. They had, there was a bunch of Soviet agents that that you know were, were were spying on the project. But but you know this is the Manhattan Project. This is World War II. The country's fighting for its life. You know the the there's extreme danger. You think at least you'd be worried about Nazi spies, if not you know if not Soviet Soviets because Soviet Union ostensibly an ally during World War II. Here's Feynman's cracking safes and sh showing this showing that there was security. Lapses and uh, it's it's amazing that he didn't get you know get get arrested and sent to Leavenworth you know for, for for this audacious stuff that he was doing as a kid, junior scientist at the, during the Manhattan Project. Yeah, he really is just being a kid. And one of the things we should keep in mind: he's in in the middle of the desert. There's nothing there for entertainment. Here's this guy that loves numbers. He thinks about math from like the time he wakes up till the time he goes to bed. So what's he going to do for entertainment? He's just going to, he's going to mess with his friends and, and play pranks on them. So he's cracking their safes and uncoding their, their locked drawers and things like that. In one instance, he took out some classified documents and left a note. Guess who? <laughs> it's just, yo, you know, this would be, this would be like a playful prank. If you pull it in on your colleagues in the, in the physics department at Princeton university, in the midst of the Manhattan project during World War II, it's a little, you know, it's a little, a little uh, dicey. It's a little more audacious to, to do something like that. It was risky and it really did come back to bite him to an extent because Klaus Fuchs, who was one of these Soviet spies, uh, had grounds to sort of point direct suspicion toward Feynman. You know, right. people had figured out that Feynman was this safe cracker. He's grabbing these documents and stuff. Well, what's he doing with them? So, so yeah, it, it did come back to Biden. And in fact, later in his career, he would sort of, you know, f I wouldn't say flee, but he'd leave the U.S. In, in part to sort of get, you know, take the heat off him for a while. So, yeah, during the 1950s, uh, you know, of course, uh, Joseph McCarthy became infamous for this, although, you know, we published an essay in TOS vindicating McCarthy on on the basis of a lot of new evidence that that's available, showing that in the early 1950s, when McCarthy started his so-called witch hunts, uh, yeah, most Soviet agents had been cleared out of U.S. government networks, especially at the State Department, but there was still some left, and McCarthy was right in a number of cases. So the, so the U.S. security was starting, you know, this is the Cold War now, and the Soviets are a genuine menace, and because of the spying at Los Alamos, they had the atomic bomb, so they were really dangerous, and so anybody who was suspected of, you know, had any grounds for being suspected of, uh, of spying for the Soviets would, uh, you know, would, would come under surveillance, and uh, Feynman, Feynman had given some grass crack in the safes, you know, his colleagues' safes at Los Alamos in the midst of the Manhattan Project. So, uh, some suspicion. And and by the way, I I mean, 
Feynman had a bitter divorce with uh, I forget her name, and 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 but his ex-wife, uh, his ex-wife wrote a letter to the FBI, I think, pointing the finger that that Feynman's a suspicious character. You I may uh, get him under surveillance. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, and one more stick of evidence for for this sort of suspicion that he had communist sympathies, and I I, I don't know, I haven't really looked into if this has any real grounds, but supposedly he was planning a trip to, um, a, you know, an autonomous communist government within the Russian empire around the time of his death. And, uh, it never came to fruition, but his daughter went or something like that. So I'd be curious to know, because, you know, we don't, I mean, he was a genius and, and perhaps he did have communist sympathies. Um, yeah, perhaps that will come out someday. But from the evidence that we do have, I think it's it's definitely arbitrary to, to say that he, he he was, in fact, no, there's no smoking gun here, but several people did accuse him of it. And if this, you know, plan for travel was true, then it certainly raises the question of why he would want to go to this communist, uh, this communist uh, small town or whatever it was in Russia. Well, you know, if, if that was near the time of his death, then that was that was 1988. So this is this is right 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 before the collapse of the Soviet Empire. Uh, this is not during the the 1950s during the, or 1940s when he was working at Los Alamos. I don't know any evidence that Feynman was a communist or had communist sympathies, but I certainly don't don't doesn't sound like he was spying for the Soviets, um, even even with Oppenheimer. Where there was a lot of smoke around around Oppenheimer, he was the FBI had 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 the evidence that he had joined the Communist Party. I don't know if he was still a member of the Communist Party when he was heading the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos, but he had joined the Communist Party, and consequently, and the Communist Party was run by the Soviets. You know, we know that uh, with certainty. But still, there's you know, in fairness to Oppenheimer, uh, there's no evidence that he was spying that he was spying for the Soviets. So, and certainly, I certainly don't know of any. About fine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, spent several years at Los Alamos, and uh, in 1945, on the recommendation from Hans Beth, who's his superior at the Manhattan Project, gets a teaching job at Cornell in Ithaca, New York, and heads up there to to take over. His father dies shortly before, and of course, his wife died. And so at this point, he's extremely depressed. He's not really all that focused. Yet somehow he finds the time and energy to do fundamental work in physics and really lay the groundwork for what he would later win the Nobel Prize for, this work in quantum electrodynamics, which I don't understand, but I read that is a sort of integration between quantum mechanics and Einstein's theory of special relativity. So, um, you know, take that uh, with a grain of salt, if you will. Uh, I, I don't know. I, like I said, I, I don't know uh, the, the, the actual physics, but, um, it, you know, he's clearly doing pioneering work and his colleagues recognize it. And, uh, you know, at first this leads to some controversy, but uh, ultimately the, the, the facts uh, all show in his favor. And, and so his theories become sort of a norm that are cited by many other physicists and students of physics. Right. Yeah, now, now, like you, John, I don't know the first thing about physics. I don't claim to, to be a scientist of any kind. I'm an inveterate humanities guy. And if I had to take, you know, a science program and, you know, at Podunk Valley Junior College, I probably would have flunked out. So you get the, the math and the science are definitely not my, you know my my field, but but we we do know that Feynman you know um, reached these 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 magnificent achievements. He was he's considered there was some was there some poll taken of scientists and he was ninety nine Physics World poll. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you. And he was it, it, but right at the turn of the twenty first century, Feynman was considered the seventh was it the seventh greatest physicist of all time, by by his peers. Well, you know. You know, scientists are human. We can be a little cynical. Scientists are human beings. They have their favorites. They like somebody. They don't like somebody else. You know, 
you know, uh, he was mean to my, my, this guy was mean to my, my daughter-in-law, and so I don't, you know, I don't, I don't like him. But, you know, most, most of the great physicists are long gone. You know, I mean, you're thinking of, of Newton, you know, f- for sure. Einstein was gone uh, by, by that time. Uh, so Fe- Feynman was, you know, was one of, was, I think Feynman was gone too by that time. He, he died in 1988. But yeah, nevertheless, that still has, you know, the, that still has some credibility. You hope the scientists are being objective, you know, here looking at the scientific work, not at personal relationships. Yeah, Feynman was abrasive, you know, at, at times, but um, and and has had had a uh, what was it? A, 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 we, could, we we could say a a, uh, uh, a shady, right? He had a, some shady relationships with with women and some shady dealings with women. But yeah, he, nevertheless. All of that this considered at the turn of the 21st century to be by by his peers to be the seventh greatest scientist of history, or seventh greatest physicist of history. That I think has some credibility. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but you know, we should talk about these these shady relationships. I mean, I don't know the details, but it's said that he had relationships with undergrad students, that he slept with this- the wives of some of his friends, that he occasionally got prostitutes. Uh, he was very, you know, he was very depressed. He's lost his wife. He had, he had lost his father. He had some misgivings about the Manhattan Project and about not questioning it more deeply once the Germans were out of the war and it was just down to Japan. Um, you know, like many scientists involved, he sort of thought, well, is this something we should have moved forward with? But uh, his these flaws are far overshadowed by his incredible virtues as a, a teacher and a physicist, as we'll see. Right. This was that those shady relationships you mentioned were his years at Prince uh, at Cornell, right? When he was he was a professor, he was a professor at Cornell, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, he, you're a professor, and, and, and of course, this is this is not to condone it, but I mean, it's a, it's an open secret on college campuses how many professors are having affairs. With uh, you know, with with their students, and very often meet their wives, you know, meet meet their wives that way. I have to confess, I've done it. <laughs> you know, although although I won't mention any names here. Although the student, I was a night class. I guess it mitigates it somewhat. It was a night class. The student was a, the student was an adult, not a not an 18, 19, 20 year old kid, and. And we did wait till after the semester had ended, barely. But you know, we did. So, but anyway, it's it, it's not to condone it, but it goes on all the time. Fine. So I don't know how old the the, the ladies were. The Feynman, you know, if if they're 18, 19, 20 year old kids, you know, they're they're still kids. That does does make a difference. But the prostitutes, you know, you know the sleeping with your wives of your friends, I and mean, yeah, yeah, that's a little, you know. Uh, yeah, that's that is definitely uh, you know that's dishonest and um, so yeah so we we've never been shy, John, about criticizing the heroes for their legitimate flaws, but we always point out as as rational hero worshippers what you just said, the 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 life giving achievements, the enormity of the achievements vastly outweigh, you know the the flaws, and certainly doing Feynman's case. Yeah, and so. You know, while he's at Cornell, he's doing this this groundbreaking work in quantum electrodynamics, and he attends in 1948 uh, a conference called the Pocono Conference with a, a lot of other big name physicists. Uh, Paul Dirac was there, also named on this on this 1999 poll. He was, by the way, named number five. Uh, Julian Schwimmer, who Feynman, along with uh, one other physicist, Shin Ichiro Tamanaga. Whoa, you, you, you talk good, John. That was impressive. <laughs> that was imp- impressive with, with the Japanese name. The three of them, if I, if I didn't butcher that, uh, the three of them shared the Nobel Prize in, in 1965. But the, the road to that is pretty interesting. So at this 48 uh, conference, he presents his work in quantum electrodynamics, or, the, or at least the beginnings of it, and he's using his own form of notation called Feynman diagrams, something he'd come up with his own language, essentially, for communicating fundamental concepts in, in physics. And it was, he was the only one familiar with it. So he really confused and confounded his, his contemporaries. 
and somewhat alienated some of them. Paul Dirac and, and Niels Bohr both were there and raised objections to Feynman's approach. I think Ed, Edward Teller did also, right? The father of peacetime uh, atomic energy. I think Teller also had uh, objections to it, to it. Yep. And so several of his contemporaries, you know, just didn't think that he was on the right track. And Freeman Dyson, who, you know, later became a, a great physicist as well. Well, he was right. there too. And with, uh, with their blessing, he soon published a paper that integrated key ideas from Schwinger's hypothesis, from Feynman's and from Tomonaga's, and really showed a, a way forward. Um, Dyson himself considered Feynman's to be the best and simplest formulation. And Feynman over the next several years between the time of the conference in 48 through 1951, goes about publishing the series of papers explicating his views on the subject and, and showing their applications. And then students begin using these Feynman diagrams and citing his work. And then soon a, a computer application is created for computing with them, which gives physicists this whole new extraordinary boost in power. So, you know, although he's restless at Cornell during these years, he's doing some pretty shady stuff. Um, despite all that, he still manages to get this fundamental work done in quantum mechanics and quantum electrodynamics, uh, for which he's later awarded the Nobel Prize. Right. And you, I mean, it, it really it kind of boggles me that you know you develop notations, you know, this this new approach that confounds like the leading minds in the field. We're Neil, Neil's, we're talking some real heavyweights: Niels Bohr, Edward Teller, you know, pe you know, people like that. Uh, and, and it's, like, it's like beyond them to, to initially grasp it. You know, I mean, that speaks to you being quite an innovator in the, you know, in the field. And Feynman certainly was. What year did he win the, the Nobel? Was it 65? I think, yeah. All right, so he's 47 at, uh, you know, at that time. Was he still at Cornell in 65 or had he moved to Caltech by that time? So in uh, 51, 52 is when, so in 49, the Soviets get the, the atomic bomb or they, they detonate, detonate one. And this generates a lot of suspicion, uh, suspicion over uh, espionage in the uh, Manhattan Project. And Feynman around this time has a sabbatical and elects to take it in Brazil. So he goes to Brazil and teaches there for a couple of years. And then in, um, I think it was 52 or 53, he's lured to Caltech. Uh, he doesn't go back to, to Cornell. And he spends the rest of his career teaching at Caltech. And so in 65, that's where he was. He was at Caltech. Okay. Yeah, I know he, I know he spent many, many years there. And by the way, uh, the, we, we should point out the, the, the espionage at Los Alamos and, and the acquisition of you know, the Soviet acquisition of the bomb and, and the, de the detonation in 1949 has real world consequences because we know today that Stalin, who was... You know, who was a you know, puppet master with the North Korean regime at that time. Stalin, you know, the North Koreans were ready to invade South Korea. Stalin would not give the go-ahead until the Soviets had successfully detonated, uh, detonated the bomb because uh, you know, he was afraid of American nuclear uh, intimidation. Once, once the Soviets had the bomb, then the, the bloody, you know, uh, disastrous Korean War is launched. So, you know, there's, the, the, these kinds of... Uh, D despicable acts of espionage have powerful and devastating real world consequences. But anyhow, but, but anyhow, I, I, I very seriously doubt, like I said before, that Feynman had anything to do with, with, with spying for the, for the Soviets. At least there's no evidence. There's no evidence uh, for that. So, so he's at Caltech, wins the, <coughs> excuse me, wins the Nobel Prize for physics. Uh, Sounds like very deserved um, and uh, is there for the next 20, 23 years of, uh, of, of his career until his untimely death in 1988. And I can, I, I mean, I don't want to skip over decades if there's, if there's things that you want to mention, but I can remember him, you know, with the, the, in, the, in the investigation, the, the congressional hearings on the Challenger uh, explosion. This was this was near. This is near the end end of his life when he was on that on that committee. But there may be things. Did you want to mention things between 1965 uh, Nobel 
prize and the 1986 uh, hearings on the Challenger uh, explosion? So, some of the things that he's best known for happened between then. So um, in 1960, Caltech approached him and asked him to start reviving or, or, or recreating their physics curriculum. And so with a couple of uh, graduate students, he starts turning some of his lectures into books, into resources that other people can use. And so uh, in the early 60s, he puts out what are still available for sale, these great references on physics for, for learning, for, for people who don't really have a physics and math background called the Feynman Lectures on Physics. And then in 64, he returns to Cornell where he'd, he'd worked for a while. And uh, he gives, the, so there's this series of lectures that began in 1924 called the Messenger Lectures. It's always given by a, a prestigious uh, leader in, in a given field and probably the most famous of all the Messenger Lectures series was the one that Feynman gave in 1964. They were recorded. It was titled The Character of Physical Law. And it's a seven lecture series that you can go on YouTube today and watch. And you get to see this incredible mind at work. And not being a, a physics math guy myself, you know, I have trouble keeping up with some of it. Uh, and you know, I can't vouch fully for the effectiveness of his, of his teaching methods. He was, he was a little scattered, but when you experience firsthand a mind that powerful, you really can't help but be inspired by him. And you just get to see what his students got on a regular basis. And to, to see that kind of mind at work would, would light a fire under me, I know, if I were in that field to get better and better because he's just doing these incredible things and he's explaining very big concepts in ways that are, are humorous and simple, easy to retain. And then in, from time to time, he'll go, go off into a little bit of a rabbit hole. But uh, the point is just, if you're, if you're into physics or you're, you're curious about Feynman, you want to see his teaching style. I think this is one of the, the greatest uh, examples that you can get the character of physical law this, if you just look up messenger lectures at Cornell, and I believe Bill Gates, who was a pretty big uh, Feynman fan at some point, put a project together to, to make these and other lectures available. And, uh, and now they are, they're still available. They're, they're available now though on YouTube and anyone can go watch them for free. And they're, and they're incredible. Yeah, Feynman certainly, um, well, everybody who knew him firsthand were very impressed with the power of his intellect. And I just wanna say as an aside, YouTube, is a, is a tremendous asset. I mean, it, it says what well, it's a reservoir of of stuff. A lot of it, you know, a lot of it maybe of not great value, but there's an, an enormous That's amount sure. of yeah, right. But you could also there's an enormous amount of value on YouTube. You could find so much good stuff up there. Like last week, for instance, you know, we we celebrated the goat. You know, Michael Jordan on the Hero Show and his. Anybody who hasn't seen MJ play and you want to, there's a lot of footage, you know, up on YouTube that that you can watch. So it, so it's great, and it's great that, you know, that the Feynman lectures are are, are available for all for, for people who are interested in in physics and you know and, and and science more broadly to see a great mind like that at at, at work. So, you know, those years at Caltech. Um, so should we just should, should we discuss the Challenger explosion and his role in the in the the investigation? Let's do it. Yeah. So I think it was 1986, wasn't it, when the space the space shuttle uh, Challenger explode? I can remember that. Oh, that was a horrible. That was a, I remember. You know, I was teaching American Renaissance School, you know, prep school in in White Plains, 1986. I just you know, received my PhD in, in philosophy. And I was teaching and somebody, you know, it said, Dr. Bernstein, the space shuttle exploded. So, you know, looked at the footage on TV and it just, you know, I just, my stomach was just, I, I, I just, I just ached because all of these brave, you know, astronauts were just, you know, blown to smithereens. And they knew, they knew the risk. I mean, every, anybody involved in, in space exploration knows, you know, it's, it's very, very, very risky. In fact, in fact, John, uh, I just saw a quote recently. I think it was from Roy Spencer, you know, a former NASA scientist, and you know, and a, and, you know, and a, a 
somebody who's very knowledgeable in climate science. And Roy Spencer was talking about, you know, Elon Musk's plan to go to Mars and everything. And he said something like, you would think that I'm, you know, I'm a NASA guy, that I'm all in favor of this. He said, but I don't want to go. He said, it's dangerous. It's risky. There's, there's nothing there. There's no, there's no life there. He said, go, just go, <laughs> Roy Spencer said, just go to any desert. He said, you know, you get the same thing as Mars and you can breathe. <laughs> so space exploration is risky, without a doubt. Everybody, everybody involved in it knows that. But still, it was, it was, it was, it was a tragedy. It, 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 it really, I really hurt when I, when I watched that footage. Well, I think it, it certainly was. And I think that everyone involved knew that there were risks, but I actually don't think that they knew the extent of the risks. And this was one of the things that really peeved Feynman, really pissed him off because uh, not only did they have astronauts, but they also had Krista McAuliffe, who, uh, if I recall right. correctly, yeah. was a, a, you know, a school teacher right. who they had brought into this project, recruited based on these false estimates of the shuttle's safety. And, uh, you know, it, it came out during the project, and Feynman noted this, that executives were saying that there's something like a one in 100,000 chance of something going wrong, when in fact, NASA's own engineers were saying it was like one in 200. And so they, they had this, this culture at NASA, which, you know, this is a government agency, and it's somewhat unsurprising given that they don't have the same built-in uh, incentives, incentive structures that a private organization does, but they were, they were incentivized to get results sometimes at the uh, expense of having a good vetting process for getting those results and really knowing what was on the line. And, and so uh, it's, it's really, it was a tragedy that Feynman seemed to think from what I understand that it was um, at least somewhat more avoidable than those in, in charge thought it was. Is that yeah, your read of it as, as well? Yes. Yeah, yes. And it was the, I remember with, with the, the questions came down to the, the safety parameters for the, with the so-called O-rings. Right. And I think was, I think that was part of what caused the explosion that they, uh, they, they had, they had a problem at, at, at low temperatures, right? And at the, at the committee hearings on national TV, Feynman, who had, you know, a, a, a puckish sense of humor, you know, you know took, took one of those rings and, and dropped it in a, in a glass of ice water, right? right? And to, to show, if I'm remembering correctly, this, this goes back to the 1980s, he dropped it, he dropped it in the glass of ice water, you know, in, in, in the, at the, at the congressional hearings to show the deleterious effects of the, of the cold, you know, on this, you know, on, on, the, on the O-ring and that, and that, and that they should have been more, they should, they should have been more aware of it. Well, well, like you said, it's very possible they were aware of the dangers and they, 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 they covered it up. Yeah. Yeah. The O-rings are, were less resilient at cold temperatures and it was an unusually cold day, the, the day of the launch. And so, they did not hold up in, in their launch conditions. Yeah, and, and as you're rising, you know, through the through the atmosphere, it's uh, the the temperature the temperatures up there are are a lot lower than at at, at sea level, isn't it? Isn't that right? If I remember my <laughs> whatever little I know about high school physics, the commission report. Um, so there was an appendix to it that they had tried to take parts of out. And uh, Feynman actually refused to sign it until it was added back in. And he said something like, for uh, actually, he said, quote, for a successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. And I don't know all the specifics, but he, he clearly thought that they were, you know, they were ignoring facts. And those facts are what that, that ignorance is what led to this horrible disaster. Right. Yeah, absolutely right. Again, I'm, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, I'm on a, I'm on a plane and, uh, you know, I'm looking at the computer screen and it gives me the outside, outside air temperature is, you know, you know, what, what, at, at ground level, it was, you know, 33 degrees and outside air temperature up at 35,000 feet is, you know, minus 14 or something. So, so I'm just inferring from that, that, you know, the, as you, as you climb, you know, the, in altitude, the temperature the temperature generally generally drops. Am I am I, am I making a mistaken inference from from this information on the on the plane? I get on the planes. I'll buy it. 
All right. So well, anyhow, if if the uh, if the O rings had trouble at at low temperatures, then you know then that's obviously going to be a problem when you're going to leave the you know when you're going to leave the, on a rocket, you know, leaving the atmosphere. But that's a great quote from Feynman. You know that nature can't be fooled, and the reality must take precedence over over public relations. And what, what did he say in dealing with technology, especially? Yeah, especially when the human lives are on the line here. Reality must take precedence over public relations because nature can't be fooled. I mean, that's perfect. I mean, that could that, that could come out of Atlas Shrugged. Right? I mean, that, that could be something that, that Dagny Taggart said or, you know, or, or, or John Gall. Yeah, beautiful line. And, um, and so, like you said, this is toward the end of his life, but already in 1978, if I, if I recall correctly, he had gone to the hospital with some abdominal pains. And this is uh, when he was diagnosed with liposarcoma, unless I'm mistaking my dates. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the form of cancer that killed him uh, shortly before his 70th birthday, age 69, way too young, you know, for Richard Feynman to go and, and, and for us to, to lose Feynman. But we know that tragically cancer is no respecter of you know, genius or you know or any or any or achievements or or, or, her, or heroism or any anything like that so yeah Feynman dies of a rare form of cancer uh right before a few months before his 70th birthday it's fascinating isn't it i mean we, we remember when we discussed michelangelo and we were, we were marveling. It's this guy, what he looked to be almost 88, I think, he, he, or 89. I think he, he did Michelangelo die like shortly before his 89th birthday or, you know, or something like that. And, and, and the guy didn't take care of himself at all. You know, my mother used to say you can't burn the candle at both ends, which is generally true, unless you're Michelangelo. You know, and, and you, you don't sleep, you don't eat well, you know, you're, you're slovenly and everything. and You're dirty and God knows you're breeding ground for germs. It doesn't matter. Work all the time, uh, drive yourself hard. Sculpting's got to be hard, physical work. Doesn't matter. He, had, he must have the constitution of a mule, as they say. Lives to be 88, 89. And this was in the Renaissance. They didn't know anything about medicine, you know, in the, in the 16th century. But in the 20th century, where they did know a lot more about medicine, but Feynman dies at age 69. I doubt he, uh, I, I, I doubt he lived, I, I don't know about his personal lifestyle. I, I doubt he lived the kind of the way that way Michelangelo did. I imagine he was sleeping and eating a better diet, but you know, it's, you know, as a, as an MD, John once said to me, you can't entirely escape your genes. And so I don't know, you know, what, what's in, what's in Feynman's family, what's his, in his genetic uh, background. Uh, sadly dies at age 69. We just marvel at Michelangelo, you know, almost 88 or 89, the way the way he lived. Uh, but you know, the you just have that you have that constitution. You know, some people have that constitution, and you know, they, there's there's people who smoke smoke several packs of cigarettes every day and live into the, live healthy. They're healthy into their 90s. So so you know. You just don't know what what, the, what anybody has in their family background and, and their genetic makeup. Yeah, he he did die young, but uh, he was he was even younger at heart. You know, we're titling this episode the the great souled scientist, and that was really you know that really describes Feynman well. He was just from from beginning to end, he was just a very independent but fun loving guy. What did Andrew Carnegie say? Something like a sunny disposition is is worth more than millions. Something, something like that. Sunny disposition is worth a fortune, I think. Something like that, Carnegie said. Another one of our heroes. Yeah, yeah. Feynman was a fun-loving guy. We should we should emphasize that he played the bongo drums, you know, uh, hang out in, in bars. Maybe he did live the Michelangelo, <laughs> you know, lifestyle. I don't I don't know. But I, I have just a couple of personal anecdote anecdotes here. Uh after his first wife, Arlene Greenbaum, died, and everything, she, may, she may have been the love of his life. He certainly was in love with her and, and just went you know, you know, the extra miles to be with her, like you said, against the family wishes, got married. She was an invalid, but you know, did everything he could to, you know, so the families you know, didn't want the, the marriage, but you know, married her anyway, took care of her, you know, really, obviously really loved her, wrote her a letter after her death, I don't remember how long it was after her death, uh, 
and then ended the letter in, you know, it's, it's a heartbreaking letter. He's pouring out his love to his, his wife who died, speak of dying young, she was in her early 20s, right, when she died of tuberculosis. Um, the, like, the, the, like the last line in the letter, or one of the last lines in the letter was, forgive me for not mailing this letter, but I don't know your new address. <laughs> you know, and there's, uh, there's the element of your know, puckish humor in the midst of all of this profound heartbreak. Yeah, if you, wanna, if you want to have your heart broken, you can read the letter and it's included in a piece by Lisa Van Dam published at the Objective Standard called Enrich Your Life with Poetry and have some tissues handy because it is a tearjerker. Yes, it's a beautiful letter. It's a beautiful letter to his deceased wife. How old was he? How long after the, her death did he write that? Do you, do you remember of him? He, he wrote it in 46, I believe. So only about a year, if that. Was, was that letter like sealed in an envelope and, and, and opened at some point? Or I, I vaguely remember that he sealed it and it was opened after his death. Is that right? Right. Yeah. He put it, put it in a drawer or something and, and never opened it, but uh, it was found after his death. Wow. So that's 42 years later, the, the, that letter was found. And the, the thing that's striking here to me is, you know, I, I could understand the heartbreak having been in love, you know, the, the, the woman you love or the man you love as the case may be dies and dies so young, it's heartbreaking. But that, that's, that's still that Feynman, that Feynman sense of humor at the end. I don't know you knew it's best. I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's so distinctive to him. Yeah, and his and, last words, I think, are just as irreverent. Uh, <laughs> well, 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 before we get to his last words, let me tell a story here. Because I, I, I was speaking a personal story. I, I, I was speaking before about when I was teaching at American Renaissance School, this prep school in the White Plains, when I, you know, in the 1980s, uh, when I was like in grad school. And uh, one of my students, I'll mention his name, why not? He was a great guy, really smart, smart kid, not a kid anymore. This was 1980s. Alan Price. Uh, very good student, got accepted at Caltech, a uh, really good kid. Not, like I say, that, that was 1980, so he's certainly not a kid anymore. Goes to Caltech, meets Feynman, you know, and he's starting a band, Alan, Alan is, and he invites Feynman to play the bongos in the, in the band. And he, and he told me that Feynman's response was, he says, I would love to, but I've been diagnosed with cancer and, and, and I'm dying, so I can't. I said, oh my God, I said, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll play bongos in a band started by, a, you know, an 18 or 19 year old undergraduate. Sure, he said, you know, there's Nobel Prize winner. Yeah, he was fun loving, you know, Feynman, the only thing that stopped him from doing it was, was impending death. Which finally took him and, and supposedly his last words were, I'd hate to die twice. It's so boring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Scott. Uh, Feynman was one of a kind as a, as a scientist. His you you could read everybody could read the some of the you know the personal memoirs he wrote. What was what was it? Surely you're joking, Mister Feynman, it is one of them. And uh, why do you care what other people think? Right. Was which is was wasn't that Arlene Greenbaum saying back to him what something that he had said to her? I think at, at at one point when they were when they were very young, I hadn't heard that story, but it definitely wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, I'm not sure of it. So I'm not sure. I've, I've heard I've heard it, but but yeah, it it fits. You know, it, it fits his, his his personality, and and you know, uh, it's like memoirs of a peculiar character or something, something like that is the subtitle. And yeah, he talks about you know you know cracking the safe at, at Los Alamos and and stuff, and yeah, he definitely he's not your dry tweedy, you know, wearing his tweed, you know, suit jacket and everything, your boring high level mathematician, scientist, professor. I mean, he was a irreverent, fun-loving kind of guy. And uh, the last words, John, uh, sp speaking of, of famous last words, uh, the great Bob Hope, you know, the immortal uh, Bob Hope, the great comedian. We should do a hero show episode. He was a, he was a really, not just a great comedian, but he was a real patriot, you know, and always willing to go out and, you know, entertain the troops, you know, dur during... Uh, number of different wars but I think you know Bob Hope 
died at like 103 or something. He was he was past 100. And he was his his daughter told this story. His daughter was like 80 years old, uh, something like that. You know, maybe her late 70s at his death, and. He's, he's on his deathbed. His wife is, uh, and daughter are there. And his wife says to him, Bob, she says, I just, I just realized we didn't d- decide on an epitaph for you. What do you want on your tombstone? And in real time, Bob Hope responded, surprise me. <laughs> he said, surprise me. <laughs> but, <laughs> about, his, about his epitaph. So, you know, so, I mean, even in death, well, you know, what did Feynman say? It's so boring. Uh, um, even in debt, in debt, these kind of people have this that kind of sunny disposition that you you mentioned before that Carnegie advocated. They can still have uh, still they still have this lighthearted, still have this lighthearted approach to it that must have served them well in life. You have no responsibility to live up to what other people think you might, you ought to accomplish. He said. I have no responsibility to be like they expect me to be. It's their mistake, not my failing. This is just, again, classic Feynman, so independent, so right. irreverent. He just doesn't care what other, what other people think. He wants to do the work that interests him, and he's willing to, to shove off other sorts of responsibilities and things like that to just put all of his focus onto the one thing and, and just love what he's doing. Yeah, I mean, he, he really understood this is my life it's the only one i'm going to get and it's it's important that i fulfill it that i fulf- that i fulfill myself with fill it with the values that i want whether you know whether my family or her family want arlene to, and i to marry or not whether uh, I might get in big trouble for cracking the safe at the safes at the Manhattan Project, you know, or, or investigating the, the field that I want to, you know, explore rather than what other scientists, you know, you might think I should be exploring. You know, Feynman, Feynman understood the, the basic principle of a, of, a ra- of a rational ethics, and that is, you know, live for your own rational self fulfillment. You know, by, by honest effort. Using you know, your own your own your own effort your own mind you're not a thief you know you're not a plunderer you know, but your honest effort your own mind do what you love and, and fulfill the only life you're going to get and Feynman Feynman did the great soul scientist yeah using Aristotle's term of, of the great soul man yeah I think that's that's perfect for, for Feynman despite the shady ep- episodes in his life I think you know Feynman uh, the overarching point here is that Feynman was a great achiever and he was certainly uh, it may, may be the seventh greatest physicist of history, certainly, uh, you know, on the list. And um, I think we could uh, salute, you know, Richard Feynman here as a great hero. And I think we can, I think that's a wrap for us, John. You know, and I, w- I would uh, wish you then to have a more heroic day. Everybody out there in hero land, lead a more heroic life. And we will see you again next week on The Hero Show.